However, we have to be realistic. Language death is not a mainstream theater. It is not mainstream anything. Can you imagine Hollywood taking it on? It is so far outside the mindsets of most people that they have difficulty appreciating what the crisis is all about, because they are not used to thinking more about language as an issue in itself. Somehow, we need to change these mindsets. We need to get people thinking about language more explicitly, more intimately, more enthusiastically. Interest in a language is certainly there, in the general population. Most people are fascinated by such topics as where words come from, or what the origin of their town's name is, or whether their baby's name means anything, they are certainly prepared to play Scrabble and a host of other language games ad infinitum, and language games are often found on radio and television, too, but a willingness to focus that interest on general issues. A preparedness to take on board the emotion and drama inherent in the situation of language endangerment, is not something that happens much.
Perhaps the first example of what could be called a newspaper was the Acta Diurna, roughly daily news, that Julius Caesar introduced in 59 BC. This was a handwritten news sheet posted daily in the Forum at Rome and in other common meeting places around the city. Of course, a lot of the news would be out of date in the sense that, for example, it took a long time for reports of a victory in a distant country to get back to Rome. Nonetheless, a lot of the items included are similar to those found in more modern newspapers: news of battles, as already mentioned, as well as political and military appointments, political events, and even a social diary recording marriages, births, and deaths. One mustn't forget sport, if that is what you call it. Just like modern fans of football, sports-minded Romans could keep up with the latest results of the gladiator contests. People who lived in the provinces and wanted to be kept up to date would send scribes to Rome to copy the news and have them send it back by letter. Many of these scribes could make extra money by providing the news to more than one client. Quite a few of them were slaves. And would go on to use the extra money earned to buy their freedom.
With its radiant color and plant-like shape, the sea anemone looks more like a flower than an animal. More specifically, the sea anemone is formed quite like the flower for which it is named, with a body like a stem and tentacles like petals in brilliant shades of blue, green, pink, and red. Its diameter varies from about 6 mm in some species to more than 90 cm in the giant varieties of Australia. Like corals, hydras, and jellyfish, sea anemones are colanterates. They can move slowly, but more often they attach the lower part of their cylindrical bodies to rocks, shells, or wharf pilings. The upper end of the sea anemone has a mouth surrounded by tentacles that the animal uses to capture its food. Stinging cells in the tentacles throw out tiny poison threads that paralyze other small sea animals. The tentacles then drag this prey into the sea anemone's mouth. The food is digested in the large inner body cavity. When disturbed a sea anemone retracts its tentacles and shortens its body so that it resembles a lump on a rock. Listen to part of a lecture in a psychology class. The professor is talking about stating laws in the science of psychology. Psychology is a relatively new science. Like other sciences, psychology must be able to state laws. A law is a way of organizing knowledge about something so that we can make predictions. When enough knowledge is gained about a subject, a scientist can state precisely what will happen under certain conditions. We experimental psychologists are interested in developing laws about human behavior, so we'll be able to understand and predict what people do and why they do it. Of course, to develop laws about human behavior, we must assume there's some regularity to it. We can't be psychologists without making the assumption that behavior follows certain patterns. One of the major laws psychologists have discovered is called the law of effect. The law of effect states that whether or not a person will repeat a behavior depends on the effect that behavior has. If an action is rewarded, it's likely to be repeated. If the action is not rewarded or if it's punished, it's not likely to be repeated. How do psychologists state laws? First, using available knowledge, a psychologist makes a hypothesis about behavior. Then, the psychologist tests the hypothesis through an experiment. But even if the experiment proves the hypothesis Avalanches are a constant threat on mountain highways. The Rogers Pass stretch of the Trans-Canada is at risk of being buried in snow from November to April every year. This is why the highway now has a sophisticated defense system. The best way, uh, it's important to control an avalanche when it's small, so a slide is set off while it's still small before it builds up into a serious danger. A team of snow technicians monitors the snowpack. They sort of read the snow and try to predict when it's likely to slide. They study data from the weather stations in the mountains. As the danger increases, they drop explosives onto test slopes to see if the snow can be made to slide. It's kind of tricky trying to decide just when the snow will slide. The weight of the snow, together with the force of gravity, is what starts an avalanche. The technicians don't want to wait till it's too late, but if they're too early, before conditions are just right, the snow won't release. When the time is right, they close the road and remove all traffic from the pass. Most closures last two to four hours. Then the army comes in. 
A 10-man artillery crew operates a mobile 105-millimeter howitzer, firing shells into the slopes. This sends out shock waves that trigger the avalanches. Slides are set off one by one. The technicians direct the action, telling the troops where to aim the gun. Visibility can be awful. Then they have to check and see if the avalanche has released well enough. Sometimes they drive their trucks below the slide path, kind of dangerous work, and they listen to the snow come down. Sometimes, if the slide is bigger than they expected, they might have to make a speedy getaway. Number Long-term exposure to noise can lead to loss of hearing. The relative loudness of sounds is measured in decibels. Just to give you an idea of what this means, the sound of a whisper is 30 decibels, while a normal conversation is 60 decibels. The noise a vacuum cleaner makes is around 85 decibels. The danger zone, the risk of injury, begins at around 90. Continual exposure to sounds above 90 decibels can damage your hearing. Loud noises, especially when they come at you every day, all this noise can damage the delicate hair cells in your inner ear. Lots of everyday noises are bad for us in the long run. For example, a car horn sounds at around 100 decibels. A rock band at close range is 125 decibels. A jet engine at close range is one of the worst culprits at an ear-busting 140 decibels. The first thing to go is your high-frequency hearing, where you detect the consonant sounds in words. That's why a person with hearing loss can hear voices, but has trouble understanding what's being said. Now to The growth of the modern state brought with it the development of mass political parties and the emergence of professional politicians. A man whose occupation is the struggle for political power may go about it in two ways. First, a person who relies on their political activities to supply their main source of income is said to live off politics, while a person who engages in full-time political activities but who doesn't receive an income from it, is said to live for politics. Now, a political system in which recruitment to positions of power is filled by those who live for politics is necessarily drawn from a property-owning elite who are not usually entrepreneurs. However, this is not to imply that such politicians will necessarily pursue policies which are wholly biased towards the interests of the class they originate from. Almost everyone has heard of the London Stock Exchange, but relatively few know anything about the London Metal and Commodity Exchanges. Yet these markets have a greater influence on world economies because they set global prices for some of the essential raw materials for industry and food manufacture. The LME provides three basic services to the world's non-ferrous metal trade. First, it is a market where large or small quantities of metal of a guaranteed minimum standard can be bought and sold on specific trading days. Second, it acts as a barometer of world metal prices. And third, it is a hedging medium. That is, it can help traders get some protection from price fluctuations that occur for economic, political or financial reasons.
Abandoned pueblos are scattered throughout the southwestern U.S., and at many, archaeologists have uncovered a curious artifact, the skeletons of scarlet macaws. The bird's bright red feathers are known to have been an important status symbol, a signifier of prestige, for people throughout the American tropics in the southwest, both in the ancient world and today. But macaws are a tropical bird whose range never extended north of today's U.S.-Mexico border. So how did the Pueblo people obtain the birds? To examine the bird's origin, scientists sequenced mitochondrial DNA found within macaw bones from two sites in New Mexico, Chaco Canyon and the Mimbres region. Turns out nearly three-quarters of the birds had identical mitochondrial genome sequences, meaning the ancient birds came from the same maternal line. That suggests they were all the products of a breeding operation, perhaps in modern-day northern Mexico, rather than a random collection of wild-caught birds. Hi, everybody. This is Joe Biden. I delivered a report to President Obama laying out how far we've come since he put me in charge of the cancer moonshot. That was back in January. And to lay out a real vision for where we need to go in the immediate future, to, to do in five years what otherwise would take 10, to inject a real sense of urgency into the fight against cancer, and to change the culture and reimagine our system in order to be able to win. You know, when President Nixon declared a war on cancer in 1971, he had no army, he had no resources, and no clear strategy. But after 45 years of progress, funding research, training scientists and physicians, and treating millions of patients, we now have an army. And we have tools, powerful tools. And with the moonshot, we now have a clear strategy for the road ahead. It matters, folks, because there's a consensus now that we're at an inflection point with science, medicine, technology, all advancing faster than ever and offering real promise. But we can't play by the rules of 1971. We didn't have this working for us. There are a couple different stories you can tell about our economy. One goes like this. Eight years after the worst economic crisis of our lifetimes, our economy has created jobs for 71 straight months. That's a new record. Unemployment has fallen below 5%. Last year, the typical household saw its income grow by about $2,800, the biggest one-year increase ever and the uninsured rate is at an all-time low. All that is true. What's also true is that too much of our wealth is still taken by the top, and that leaves too many families still working paycheck to paycheck without a lot of breathing room. There are two things we can do about this. We can prey on people's worries for political gain, or we can actually do something to help working families feel more secure in today's economy. Count me in the latter camp. And here's one thing that will help right away. Making sure more of our families have access to paid leave. Today, having both parents in the workforce is an economic necessity for many families. But right now, millions of Americans don't have access to even a single day of paid sick leave. Hiroshi Ishiguro, a robot engineer from Osaka University, makes Geminoids, extremely realistic human robots. It's important that they look exactly like real people for Ishiguro to carry out his research. He's interested in understanding philosophical questions such as what is identity and what might happen if a person and their robot double were able to be in two places at the same time. His Geminoid robots have rubber skin and their heads are controlled by motors. These move the head, blink, twitch, shrug the shoulders, and make the robot appear to be breathing during conversations. 
As well as this, there are motors which are connected to a computer, microphone, and camera. These scan the controller's voice and face movements, then send messages back to the robot, which copies them. The robot's body and skin stop at his chest, though, and he has no robotic legs, so you won't see him. Not all wild animals can become domestic animals. In fact, only 14 species are fully domestic, according to one scientist. He says that six things must be true before it can happen. Without these six things, it's impossible for an animal to become domestic. Firstly, the animal must eat inexpensive food that's readily available, so humans can feed it easily. Secondly, the animal must grow fast because slow-growing animals are unhelpful to humans. It also needs to breed easily. If the animal doesn't have babies, the species will soon disappear. The animal shouldn't be frightened when placed in a small space because this is dangerous to humans. Finally, it helps if the animal lives in a group in its natural environment. If the group has a social structure, the human can become its leader. If one animal in the group accepts the human as leader, the others will probably. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Got a minute? The Nobel Prize in Chemistry goes to three men who revolutionized molecular life science: Japan's Osamu Shimomura and Americans Martin Shalfi and Roger Tsen. They developed tools to light up and see individual proteins inside living cells. These tiny molecular flashlights make it possible to study numerous events that take place in cells and whole organisms that were previously invisible, such as the development of nerve cells or the spread of cancer cells. In 1962, Shimomura, now emeritus professor at the Marine Biological Laboratory at Woods Hole, discovered that jellyfish produce a Green fluorescent protein (GFP) that glows when exposed to ultraviolet light. Some 30 years later, Columbia University's Chalfi showed that the GFP gene could be put into any organism by making sure the fluorescent protein was expressed at the same time as other proteins of interest. Researchers could literally light up events they want to follow. Then Sen at the University of California, San Diego, engineered fluorescent proteins in various colors. The multicolor palette enables researchers to follow multiple biological processes at the same time. Thanks for the minute for Scientific American's sixty-second science. I'm Steve Mursky. Various studies have suggested that eating garlic can be good for you. It's been credited with lowering blood pressure, protecting against heart disease, preventing blood clots, even fighting off colds. Now researchers from the University of Alabama at Birmingham think they have a better idea how garlic might work its medicinal magic. The Alabama team exposed red blood cells to the juices pressed from a standard supermarket issue clove of garlic, and they found that the garlic-soaked cells started giving off hydrogen sulfide, which is the gas that gives rotten eggs their delightful bouquet. Okay, I know you're probably thinking that smelling like sewage seems even more odious than reeking of garlic, but on a molecular level, a pinch of hydrogen sulfide can be just what the doctor ordered, because hydrogen sulfide serves as a chemical messenger that helps relax blood vessels and increase blood flow, which could explain some of garlic's cardiovascular benefits. 
Of course, more studies are needed to show whether a clove a day really does keep the doctor away. In the meantime, enjoy your garlic bread, and don't worry about the garlic breath. Just think what the insides of your arteries must smell like. The university provides different excellence of facilities for students and staff. All industries can be thought of a system as input, process, output and feedback. Financial help for undergraduate study is available on application. A National Collection Center for Students is currently being built. Libraries provide a lot of useful services for students. Parents today are more responsible for their children's education. Mechanical engineering has become prominent since the Industrial Revolution. University departments carefully monitor articles and other publications by faculty.
students who are successful have good strategies for learning.